Shanna. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here. We were connected through Sarah Austin, who has been using her powerful voice to share the legacy of her daughter, Trinity, who passed on, at an untimely stage in her life. And Sarah said, Shanna has her own journey with endometriosis and one that she believes you should share with others who are feeling perhaps isolated, struggling, one know they're not alone. So I, I'm very grateful today that you've decided to share this with us here. Thank you. Thank you. So can you tell me when you first started having symptoms of endometriosis and maybe I'm assuming you didn't even know what it was at that time, but just started having the pangs of this disease? Yeah. So, um, when I was 16 years old, um, I went to the doctor, like having extreme pain. They basically diagnosed me as if it was a urinary tract infection, although with the urine culture and everything, it didn't show any bacteria in my urine. They just sort of, I guess, assumed that that's what it was. And they gave me antibiotics and treated me for that, but I kept having to go back. And every time I would go back, there wouldn't be bacteria in my urine and um, they would just keep treating it as if it was a urinary tract infection. And um, it was very odd. At some point, um, because there was no bacteria in my urine, they thought that I was drug seeking, like seeking pain medicine or something like that, or in my head, um, because they weren't seeing, they weren't seeing anything like in my urine or, or elsewhere. So that basically started on a long journey of going to all these urologists to try to find out what was wrong with my urinary tract because I kept being told that it was urinary tract related. But every time I would go to a urologist, nobody would know what was wrong. Um, there was actually a period of time where they thought maybe the reason that I was having pain was because um, I wasn't fully voiding my bladder. And so there was a period of time in my life where I was having to use a catheter on myself um, because they thought that that is what the, what the issue was, but it wasn't. I mean, it took 23 years to be diagnosed with endo from the first time I had um, a symptom. And I ended up going through an exploratory laparoscopic surgery after three years of fertility treatments. And that's when it was discovered that I had endometriosis. The strange thing is, is while I was going through the fertility treatments, I was doing acupuncture as well. And I was like, oh, this is weird. I'm not getting urinary tract infections anymore. And it oh. turns out it was the acupuncture that was actually treating my endo, I had no idea. So to this day, acupuncture is kind of like the only thing that is still helping with my pain. Wow. Um, yeah. It's interesting how there's always, <laughs> like another reason that, that they, they don't look for endo first. It's not the first and foremost thing that doctors necessarily look for, especially if it's symptoms that are not necessarily correlating at the time with your menstrual cycle. Were you having these urinary tract symptoms or pain? Was it around your cycle, like in or around? Um, not necessarily. It was kind of at really at any time. And that still kind of is the case for me. There isn't any like specific times in my cycle when I'm having when when I'm having issues. I mean, luckily the acupuncture has really um, helped a lot with respect to you know kind of eliminating that pain. But I mean, it was so frustrating because I spent years just like not knowing what was wrong with me. I mean, when I was in college. I feel like as I got older, the pain started getting worse. And when I was in college, like it would be to the point where I would be doubled over in pain. One of my friends would take me to the ER. I would sit in the ER suffering for hours. And then eventually after sitting there for hours and them doing all these tests and not knowing what was going on, they would give me morphine for pain. I would be in there. They would, you know, use the IV fluids and, and that was it. I was discharged the next day and they just sort of assumed it was urinary tract or kidney related or something like that, even though there was nothing showing that that's what it was. And I did that for years. And not at any time did someone say we should have you see a gynecologist during those, yeah. those like intense ER visits? No. And it's weird too, because, um, I would go, I would go and they would just continue to assume that it was urinary tract related, despite the fact that there was no bacteria in my urine. There was nothing indicating that. There was actually a long period of time too, where um, they had me taking a, 
a small dose of an antibiotic um, after sexual intercourse, thinking that you know it was urinary tract related too, and that that would that would help. But I think what would happen is I would just have an endo flare up, and then it would go away, and it wasn't really the antibiotic helping right. me. Right. Right. So, you know. Yeah, that what is your advice? Because you, you went through 23 years of suffering to get to an endo diagnosis that only came because you were going through fertility issues. Um, what would you say to somebody who's, you know, going through the same thing where it's like, they're getting told they have UTIs or getting told they have stomach issues, IBS or whatever, and nothing is really showing up clinically and they're still suffering and they, like you said, they have these flares. So they're, they're good. And then they're not so good. Um, what advice would you give them? Well, um, I was, I'm pretty vocal. I'm like, I'm an attorney. I'm pretty outspoken. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was a very strong advocate for myself and I went everywhere, but like nobody was listening regardless of that. I think there is a, a changing environment generally where people know what this is. Um, so it's, I, I hope that because of that, and because people are talking about it and what their symptoms are, um, that, that won't be, that won't be the case. I mean, because again, I grew up at a time where nobody knew what endo, mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't hear about endo until probably around the time that I got diagnosed with it in 2019, to be honest with you. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm just hoping that getting the word out will help with that. I think people do need to be advocates for themselves. I think now there are a lot more resources, I guess, to, to know, because there's a, a huge range of symptoms. Because yeah. I mean, some of the things that I was experiencing, I wouldn't think were endo symptoms, because what they tell you is, oh, you have painful periods. Well, I had painful periods, but I thought it was normal to have cramps when you have a period. And, right. um, you know, you, you, you never know. Um, but there, there's just such a wide range of symptoms that if you have any of them that maybe you should be asking for that. The problem is, is that, and I wish there was a different way and I don't know what it is, but the problem is that really an exploratory lapar laparoscopic surgery is really the only way to diagnose, mm -hmm. which for me actually caused me way more problems. Like after I had the exploratory lap, my pain was worse. So I had it under control with acupuncture and then it got worse after the exploratory lap. So it'd be really great through research and what have you to try to figure out a better way to diagnose. I don't. Right. Yeah. There is, it. there is some research that they're doing where they're trying to take like, um, samples from a menstrual pad or tampon and be able to actually diagnose endo through the menstrual blood. It's still clinically being researched, but it is something they're trying to do to avoid having people go under the knife and having to have tissue cut and having a biopsy and samples and taking, you know, going through that entire process, because also that's expensive if you don't have insurance. That's hard to, to get the right doctor to do that kind of procedure. And it's, it's a hefty procedure to have to go through just to get a diagnosis and then find out that you might need a more advanced surgery in the future. Um, that's the thing with endometriosis that's so tricky. It's that I keep wanting the definition to be changed because it's known as a reproductive disease. It's known as a pelvic disease. And it, and it, can go anywhere in the body. Like when you're talking about urinary tract symptoms, I always thought that I had a small bladder <laughs> because I had to pee all the time, all the time to the point where it was like a running joke with my friends. Little did I know I actually had deep infiltrating endometriosis in my bladder and my bladder was sick from endo. And that was causing this like constant urge and frequency and, and pain, even urinating. So the doctors just thought the doctor was, uh, was not a gynecologist, but it was just a normal doctor and said, well, you know, maybe you need one of those pills to like, for people that are, you know, like postmenopausal 60 plus he's like, to, uh, I forget the name of it, but he's like to calm your bladder because you have an overactive bladder. I was like 20 <laughs> and oh, no yeah. one ever thought of endo. I always had bad periods. I got my period at 11 and I would be bal balled over with a heating pad and Advil. And I would bleed for sometimes 12 days and get a period every two weeks sometimes. And I had ovarian cysts and Never once was it, I never heard the word endometriosis. It wasn't until I was two weeks away from my 33rd birthday when it got to a fever pitch 
and it was the worst pain in my life. And I was, you know, to ER, to ER, to doctor, to doctor, that finally someone said, you know, I think it could be this thing called endometriosis. But we are learning in the medical community, not that I'm a doctor, but just from what I've learned, is that early intervention is what stops endo from becoming you know, deep infiltrating endo. And the, of course, there's always those exceptions, but the earlier they can treat it, the better outcome for the patient, for the individual. And I feel like stories like yours and mine, it then becomes, okay, it's already spread. It's already become, um, I always call it an insidious disease. And then to manage it is almost impossible because it's just kind of gone everywhere. Um, and, and my, left, my left ovary is attached to my bowels. And the weird thing is the majority of my endo is actually on my bowels, which like now that I know what it is, makes more sense because what would happen is like, I would feel like I couldn't have a bowel movement, like, uh, you know, yep. so because I, I'm assuming because of the inflammation or whatever. So yeah, yeah. But it's weird. Mine wasn't even in my urinary tract, but I was having like what would essentially be urinary tract infection symptoms. So it's odd. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is odd. And that's, it's, that is, that's the whole thing. I just am like, it's extra pelvic. It can spread anywhere. It can go anywhere it wants to. I always think of it as like chewing gum on the bottom of a sneaker. And then it just like traces all around. It starts near uterus. And then it's just like, oh, I'm going to walk here and I'm going to attach your fallopian tube to the sidewall of your abdomen, or I'm going to cover half of your rectum so that you have pain going to the bathroom. And then you're just thinking, okay, all of these symptoms seem like something else when really the origin of the symptom is always endometriosis for those that have it, um, usually to be careful how to, how to phrase it. But I mean, what, so you're saying for those that are, are dealing with this disease to advocate for themselves, to use their voices. Um, I, do you think it's worthwhile when they go to an appointment and they're getting told it's just a UTI to say, Hey, is there any way I could just have someone look into endometriosis for me? If it seems their symptoms could possibly be that. Oh, for sure. I mean, for me, it was weird because they would always be like, well, there's no bacteria in your urine, but here's a pill. And it's like, okay, so how many, and it's weird because it, it got to the point where they like basically had me convinced that that was what was wrong with me. And so every time, you know, you'd see a new doctor or whatever, you'd be like, they'd be like, oh, do you have any, um, you know, like lingering medical issues? And I'd be like, oh yeah, I have frequent urinary tract infections, <laughs> but it yeah. was never, and it's funny because, you know, the medicine never really helped. Like, I think what happened was, is that I would have a flare up and then it would just, not be a flare up anymore, you know? So, but it, but it wasn't necessarily the medication actually helping me. Um, yeah. It was very, that, that was very odd <laughs> for sure. But I mean, then there's other, you know, and then Diana, I'm sure you know that there, there's other issues like they say, oh, you should, you should get an IUD, for example, for, to help you, or you should use some sort of birth control, hormonal birth control, and that's going to help you okay, that's fine, except for birth control also can cause other issues. So if you're estrogen dominant, right, like you can get cysts and things like that. So I've been suffering this week, this last week with a gigantic ovarian cyst that's been causing all sorts of problems with my hormones and other things that they think may be related to the IUD. So, you know, um, one thing gets fixed and another thing's an issue. And, um, well, that's, that's the whole thing with the treatment. The treatment options are so limited. And I feel like everything comes, like you said, with a side effect that makes everything more, more difficult. I know for me, I have not had any luck with IUD. I haven't had luck with birth controls. I haven't had luck with any kind of suppression medicine. It all makes it worse for me. Um, yeah. I'm at In the fact, point I think birth I'm, control makes it worse for me as well. That's yeah. I'm yeah. I'm um, at the point. No, it's good to hear every, how, how people relate, but I've heard that from so many. I don't hear anyone really say that birth control has been their, their bandaid. Um, and it is just a bandaid for so many, but that's why we're here to discuss it because there needs to be more advocacy, more awareness so that the pressure continues to be on the medical community to pay attention to the needs of one in 10 that have this disease in the United States alone so that there can be early intervention. So people don't have an average, and I say average loosely of seven to 10 years 
because you went 23. I know another woman who went 40. And we have to also change the stereotype that it's only people between, you know, 18 and 35 and their fertile years. I had a doctor say to me, what do you have? You have any kind of, um, it was a gynecologist, general gynecologist. He said, do you have um, any diseases or illnesses? I said, yeah, I have endometriosis. He goes, are you on anything for it? I said, well, no, I've tried everything. He said, well, let me tell you, you have another like 20 some odd years of this disease just waiting to erupt and explode. It's a ticking time bomb. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do about that? He goes, I don't know. And that's why we're here because nobody really knows. And there's no, there's no cure. There's no real definitive treatment for some people. Excision surgery works for some people, maybe birth control, but for the majority it is chronic and it is, and it is a hindrance to the quality of life. So I appreciate Even with excision, doesn't it come back? I mean, yeah, for many people it does. I mean, for many, for, I mean, I've heard stories where they've been completely successful in my case, that hasn't been the case. Okay. Um, and then it gets to the point of, is it emergency necessary surgery or is it to get out of pain and how many times do you go through that because with that comes adhesions and scar tissues and more complications um but your story matters because it's putting more of a highlight onto what the person that one goes through um so thank you for that yeah i mean it's not something to be honest with you there's not many people that know that i have it but after um, what happened with Sarah's daughter, I was like, this can't be happening to 18 year old women. I mean, like if, if me speaking about my experience helps at all, even though it's uncomfortable, um, I'd, rather, I'd rather do it. So, um, and hopefully it'll help. I mean, hopefully at some point doctors will pay attention and they'll, they'll figure it out. Exactly. And it takes, I think it takes a collective of voices, um, strong women such as yourself who have this incredible career and respect in your chosen field. And you're, you're just saying like you went through 23 years of not being heard or listened to and being misdiagnosed and misprescribed. And I mean, that could have come with a whole other set of issues too. Um, with even worse, Diana, when I figured out what it was, there still isn't anything to really help me. No. It's still just acupuncture that I randomly fell into that controls the pain. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, just depends right. on the day. This is exactly, yep, this is where we are. I remember telling one of my friends looking forward to an event and I, the first thing I thought was, oh, I hope I don't get sick. Hope I don't get sick that day. And that's the life that you lead of fingers crossed and hoping it doesn't strike it at the in the most inappropriate times. I've done many, I've had to draft many a briefs and do many oral arguments and trials in pain and ex, in extreme pain. And, you know, you just have to, you push through, right? But yeah. it's just not ideal. No, <laughs> and it's not, it's not an acceptable way of life. And that's why your voice is important. That's why we're here because we're not gonna make any changes if we all just sit in a corner and say, well, yeah, this is my story, it sucks. No, there's 200 million people globally with this, a similar story. And, and we've gotta make a difference and the time is now. For sure. Well, thank you for, for your honesty and directness and your, your want to, to make a change in this community for others. Thanks for speaking with me, Diana. And thank you for your work, appreciate it.